Hi guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. If you're new here, my name is April. I am a primary care nurse practitioner. I have been an NP for about a year and a half now, which is crazy, but I've worked in primary care for almost a year and I make videos on TikTok usually about my life, about about my life as an NP and about how I treat disease processes and just like my primary approach. And those have been my biggest videos on TikTok. People really like them and I feel like on TikTok it's very hard to go into depth on how to treat things. Um, because I people are only going people only go on TikTok to watch nine to ten seconds of a video, you know, and then that's it. And I know that there is a large group of people who are really looking for knowledge and looking to expand their knowledge, especially NP students, nurses, etc., who ask me all the time, what is my process to treating certain diseases? So I thought we would jump in today with my personal favorite disease process to treat, which is hypertension. Now, as we go along in this series, it is going to get more advanced, okay? I did just order myself a big easel and we are going to really dive in. I really like teaching and I feel like this is a really good, like new fun thing I want to do in 2024 is bring my knowledge to you guys. And yeah, I'm excited. So let's jump into how to treat hypertension as a primary care nurse practitioner. I feel like the majority of you guys watching this probably know what hypertension is, but it is essentially the force of blood pushing against the artery wall and it is measured in millimeters of mercury. And there is primary and secondary high blood pressure. Primary hypertension is probably what most of us diagnose people with, and that is the same thing as essential hypertension, meaning there's no specific identifiable cause behind why you have that blood pressure. The other form of hypertension is your secondary hypertension, which think of secondary as there is a secondary cause. So. Is it renal disease? Do you have a type of endocrine disorder like a Cushing's disease? Is there a phaochromocytoma, which is a big jump to take? Like, don't jump to that first. To those when you see extreme blood pressures, okay? And we'll we'll get to that. I think it's really important to talk about risk factors for high blood pressure when you are explaining it to your patient because that will go into your treatment. So risk factors are really going to be very basic things such as a lack of physical activity. I preach to my patients, I do not care what type of exercise you do, do something. 30 minutes, five days a week, or 150 minutes a week, get your body moving. It will do wonders for that pressure on your artery. Other causes are going to be being overweight or obesity, also a poor diet. So a lack of potassium, calcium, magnesium, protein, fiber in the diet. Those are all linked to high blood pressure. Now there are many others, but the American Heart Association did like a meta-analysis of 60 or so studies to try to find what were some identifiable risk factors for hypertension. When you're talking about risk factors, you really have to break them down into modifiable versus non-modifiable risk factors. Obviously things like lack of physical activity, being overweight, obese, a poor diet, alcohol consumption can be, are more of your modifiable risk factors, but there are things like non-modifiable risk factors, meaning your race, your gender, socioeconomic status, which can then play into a part into your modifiable risk factor. So always keep that in mind when you're looking at your patient and treating your patient. When we're talking about classifying hypertension, there are really two kind of schools of thought, two well-known ways to classify hypertension. One of them being the American Heart Association's guidelines that were just updated in 2017, and the other being the JNC-8 guidelines, which I believe were updated in 2014. I will go over both, but I personally follow the American Heart Association guidelines because they are a bit more aggressive. Like, let's be honest, the heart, one of the most important organs in the body, so I tend to be more aggressive with my treatment. So let's start with the JNC-8 guidelines. JNC-8 guidelines classify high blood pressure as being if you are over 60 years old with no comorbidity, no diabetes, no heart disease, nothing like that. They consider high blood pressure to be anything above 150 over 90. Now, if you are less than 60 with no comorbidities whatsoever, they classify blood pre high blood pressure as being above 140 over 90. Now, if you have any comorbidities whatsoever, and they classify high blood pressure as being above 140 over 90. I'm not gonna go into treatment per the JNCA guidelines because they are very similar 
to the American Heart Association guidelines for treatment as far as your first class medication is four drug classes that are recognized as your first line. So that doesn't change. Really the difference is when to treat with those two guidelines. Now the American Heart Association, which is the guidelines that I follow for treatment of hypertension, have four classes of high blood pressure. The first one being a normal blood pressure, which is considered less than 120 over 80. Their second class is considered an elevated blood pressure, which this is gonna sound crazy to a lot of you guys, but an elevated blood pressure is anywhere from a systolic blood pressure or the top number being 120 to 129 over less than 80. Based on these studies that they did that found that, that an increase of systolic blood pressure of 20 millimeters of mercury and an increase in diastolic blood pressure of 10 millimeters of mercury, each associated with doubling the risk of death from things like cardiovascular disease, stroke, MI. So American Heart Association does not take blood pressure lightly and neither do I, okay? The third class is gonna be your stage one hypertension, which is a systolic blood pressure of 130 to 139 and or, and or, a diastolic blood pressure of 80 to 89. If you meet either one of those criteria, you are stage one. Stage two high blood pressure is going to be a systolic blood pressure of 140 or higher and or a diastolic blood pressure of 90 or higher. And that is an overview of both of those guidelines, okay? You can follow whichever one you want. Both are considered adequate treatment, but I personally follow the American Heart Association guidelines as I have already said. Now we're going to jump into the fun part in my opinion, which is treatment. How do we treat high blood pressure? So first of all, you are not gonna treat just based off of one blood pressure unless you are looking at the clinical picture of that patient and you know that you need to treat it. In basically every instance that I have a patient come in, say I have a patient come in with a blood pressure of 135 over 85, I will say, hey, your blood pressure is a bit elevated today. Do you check your blood pressure at home? Are you nervous? Like, is something going on, etc.? And most people will be like, yes, I'm nervous. Everybody's nervous when they go to the doctor, okay? And blood pressure is very labile, so it can flow and ebb and change, but we just need to see, is this what your blood pressure is all the time, or is this just when you come to see me? Usually if somebody comes in with a blood pressure like that, I will say, here, I'm gonna give you a blood pressure log, I want you to get a blood pressure cuff from Amazon, and I want you to check your blood pressure twice a day, every day, for one week, and bring this log back to me in two weeks. I'm gonna say, we're gonna do some labs, I'm gonna check your liver, your kidney function, um, I'm gonna check your thyroid, I'm gonna check all of these things to make sure I'm not identifying a secondary hypertension, but I really need you to monitor your blood pressure at home. I have had a few instances where people come to me, first time, new patient, establishing care, blood pressure 170 over 90. Comorbidities present, we're starting blood pressure medication today, okay? I'm not waiting. That is really where you have to look at your clinical picture and decide how you're treating each individual patient, okay? What I'm telling you right now, these are guidelines. These are not, you have to do this. They're just guidelines. Technically, guidelines say that you should treat a high blood pressure that you have identified after two in-office readings, but home readings are I always want home readings. The American Heart Association has an outline, a nice little diagram of when to treat, what to treat. I will in either insert it here, just a picture of it, put a link down below so you guys can also so look at it. But anyway, you have somebody come in with a normal blood pressure, which we have classified. You are going to just repeat it in a year, have them come in for an annual physical once a year. Say you have somebody come in with a elevated blood pressure, meaning that their blood pressure is 120 to 129 over less than 80. That you are gonna talk about lifestyle, okay? What are you doing? What are you eating? What type of physical activity do you do? Um, are you overweight? Are you obese? What type of, how much alcohol do you consume? And like, let's make some lifestyle changes and let's follow up. Typically I say in six months, I'm not, concerned that you are going to have a heart attack or a stroke with a blood pressure of 125 over 75. Now, when a patient comes in with what we classify as a stage one hypertension, meaning that the systolic blood pressure is 130 to 139 and or the diastolic blood pressure is 80 to 89, I will say to them, kind of like I already said to you guys, your blood pressure is elevated today. What's going on? Now, based on our little criteria, we're now going to calculate what we call an ASCVD risk, which there is an app that you can download on your phone. It's literally called ASCVD Risk Calculator. It is from the American Heart Association. 
There's, you can also Google it and put it in. It takes into account the patient's age, gender, race, cholesterol, whether they've smoked before, whether they have diabetes, whether they're like on aspirin. And sometimes, obviously, if a patient is establishing care, you don't have cholesterol levels unless they just had labs done maybe three months ago. So that's why I always, that's why you need two blood pressure readings, okay? You need labs, you need like a look into what's going on inside the body. Per guidelines, if that ASCVD risk is over 10%, you're gonna start them on one medication for treatment and you're gonna follow up with them in one month to see the response to it. If that, if that risk is less than 10%, then you can just focus on lifestyle interventions for three to six months and reevaluate. That is typically what I do, unless you have somebody with like smoking or diabetes, which a lot of times with diabetes, they will already be on an ACE or an arm for blood pressure treatment because it is kidney protective. Now, stage two hypertension, which we have classified as a blood pressure of 140 over 90 or higher and or I start blood pressure medication then after I get two readings with some home confirmations as well. Now let's get on to medications. There are four drug classes that are seen as your first line hypertension treatment. The first one is going to be thiazide diuretics. So think hydrochlorothiazide, chlorothaladone. The next up is going to be angiotensin receptor blockers, which are ARBs, anything that ends in artin. So losartin, valsartin, Candesartin. The next is going to be your geotensin converting enzymes, which are your ACEs. Anything that ends in pril, lisinopril, captopril, ramipril, anything that ends in pril. And then the last drug class is going to be your calcium channel blockers. Now, calcium channel blockers are actually classified into two drug classes from their dihydropyridines and your non-dihydropyridines. Your non-dihydropyridines are going to be like diltiazem or verapamil, and those are really good for heart rate control. Your dihydropyridines are gonna be things like nifedipine and amlodipine, which are better for like arterial blood pressure. Whenever I'm working with hypertension, I'm picking my dihydropyridines over my non-dihydropyridines. When you are picking a blood pressure medication, it is of utmost importance that you are looking at the patient in front of you and their clinical picture. You need to take into account their race, their socioeconomic factors, their lifestyle, their job. If you are dealing with a mom who has pelvic floor issues, I wouldn't go with a thiazide diuretic first off. If I am dealing with somebody who already has the comorbidity of diabetes, I'm always picking an ACE or an ARB over a thiazide diuretic or a calcium channel blocker because those are known to be renal protective. And then if I have somebody who is black or African American, I will typically pick a calcium channel blocker first. Search has shown that they are more effective on the black population. Now there are other medications that people will choose to go with um, that are not necessarily in your first line. If they have, if you have comorbidities and they're trying to treat two things instead of one. So one of really common ones is beta blockers. Beta blockers are really for, are really for heart rate control. But if somebody has anxiety or they have some tachycardia as well with high blood pressure, then maybe you would want to pick a beta blocker over an ACE or an ARB or a calcium channel blocker. There are also medications called alpha blockers that we use a lot for people who have for men who have BPH um, or can even be used like prazosin is used a lot for people who are on sertraline because it can help with night terrors from sertraline. So, you know, if you have somebody on sertraline and they're complaining of night terrors and they also have a high blood pressure, maybe try a, praz a prazosin, you know, when like it really comes into play being a good clinician and really looking at your patients and not just like following these guidelines and saying this is this is what I do and I don't defer from the guidelines. Um, guidelines are just that. They are a way to show you where to go, but they don't necessarily have to be followed to a T. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that video. This was, this was super fun for me. I love hypertension. I love talking about hypertension. I love educating people on hypertension. It's probably 60% of what I do on a daily basis. If there's any other specific topic that you guys want me to cover, leave a comment down below of what you want it to be. I was thinking my next one might be diabetes, but that is a long video, but super interesting. I actually love treating diabetes now. It's something that I was terrified of as a new grad, and I really enjoy treating now. I have lots of ideas on what to go next, but I don't necessarily know what you guys want. So let me know if you enjoyed this. Let me know what you want me to do next, and I will see you in the next video. 
Bye guys.